All right, we are back. Sorry, guys. Welcome on. We are here in Ocean City, Maryland at the beach. It's the Atlantic Ocean. This is the beach I grew up on. This is a beach line here, and that right there, you guys, that is the house that, where the house was that I grew up in since 1974. It's one of the few single-family houses still left in all of Ocean City and all of Maryland. And we're getting ready to go inside of that house to interview my hero, my father. He also owns the house next door and the lot next door to that. That little house next door rents for uh, almost $4,000 a week, just to give you some perspective. We're going to go ahead and go in the house. I would encourage you guys to uh, definitely like, uh, not like, uh, share, swipe and share. Invite your followers onto the scope because we actually got the million hearts in the month of May. And because of that, I promise you guys I would bring you all an interview with my father. As you all know that uh, Robert Kiyosaki, his book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he had uh, his father uh, who worked for the government. Then he had his uh, friend's father who was his rich dad, who was an entrepreneur and a multimillionaire businessman. I have that person in my life was my own father, which is very fortunate for me. So we're gonna go ahead and go in the house here. And of course, just so you all know, I've got one of my nephews who is asleep right now in the house. And so we're gonna to try to be a little quiet as we're walking in. Just got a porch out here. Maybe we'll go in the porch. This is our second day living in, staying in this house. Look at the view. That's just from the first floor view. There's three floors, two more above this. Here's my sister Kelly. I want to wave to everybody here on live TV. All right. Check out that view, you guys. So I'm not gonna. This is the beach house in Ocean City, Maryland. We're gonna head on upstairs. Still a little construction still happening here. Everybody hang tight, we're getting ready to go into the master suite. And we will get this show started. Uh, he's over here relaxing in his recliner. All right. See if we can get this thing set up the proper way. Have a seat, Dad. Make yourself comfortable in your house. First time on Periscope I've ever dropped the phone. Way to go, Brian. I'm gonna close the door. So we can have a little privacy. closer. All right. Can you guys hear us okay? Give me a yes if you guys can hear me okay. I see some hearts. Can you guys hear? Just give me a yes if you guys can hear us okay. We'll get this uh, get this started here. Yes, you can hear? All right. Excellent. Well, you guys, I uh I've been uh, promising you guys after we got a million hearts in May that we would have an opportunity for, uh, for me to get on Periscope Live with my dad. And uh, as you guys already heard, um, you know, my father's been a mentor of mine, obviously, my whole life. And, you know, Robert Kiyosaki had to go find his friend's father to be a mentor to him uh, because his own father was not an entrepreneur. And so, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to learn so much uh, just through osmosis, just by being around my dad, watching him build his real estate empire, be able to, you know, he started a couple banks, he had a furniture company years ago, and uh, a very, very successful business person. Um, and, and you probably can look at his, he's got, he, he wears his old Las Brisas t-shirt from Las Brisas, his favorite restaurant out in Laguna Beach, California. 
If you see him walking down the street, you wouldn't say, oh, that's a flashy multimillionaire because that's not who he is. Uh, but the house that we're sitting in right now um, is, is a testament to you know, working hard, uh, creating success, uh, but also being very smart with your money. He's, he, he's not f very frivolous. He doesn't, you know, I've never seen my dad ever, you know, fly first class on, 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 on airplanes and he doesn't, um, you know, go in and order $100 meals. I mean, so that's just not who he is. But uh, because he's done well, making money, but also with his money, and I don't even know what this house is worth, like three and a half million or something like that. So he's got a three and a half million dollar house, a couple million dollar house next door, a couple million dollar lot next door to that. He's got the house in Annapolis, got the house in Potomac, Maryland, outside of DC. He's got the million dollar condo in Naples, Florida. He's got a multi-million dollar house he's building right now in Bethesda, Maryland that he's getting ready to move into as well. And all that kind of stuff for anybody who is obviously your entrepreneurs on this on this on this uh, on this uh, Periscope. You guys are all looking to be successful in business. You're all looking to make money, so that's why I bring these kinds of things up. Um, you know, so a few things that I learned from my dad. I want to actually start asking him some questions, so so you guys can get insights from him. You always get it from me. But um, I learned about work ethic, which I think is what a lot of people lack. I think that a lot of times you take a look at people in America. People come to America because it's a land of opportunity. If you can, you come here and you can work hard, and the sky's the limit. You can go out and do anything that you want to do in life in America. Uh, but unfortunately, I think a lot of the immigrants are the ones that, that have the most success. Um, you know, they come over here and, and uh, they're willing to work. And people that are born on the soil, unfortunately, don't seem like they have the same kind of work ethic. And I think work ethic is getting weaker and weaker. And I think other countries, like China and other companies, are, are, are eating our lunch in a lot of ways. Um, so I learned a lot about work ethic watching my dad and my mom. You know, work, they've been working together all these years. Um, so, Dad, maybe you can uh, share with everybody a little bit about your story, you know, kind of what the, uh, kind of your childhood, where you came from, you know, I, I know you're, you're, he didn't come from money, he's first generation wealth that he's built, but maybe you can take over, I'm focusing a little bit more on you and you can kind of share with everybody a little bit about. Well, Brian, I, I think that uh, what's interesting is that I grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is a, uh, wonderful area and certainly an area where you've got people of varied backgrounds but primarily well-educated, um, successful lawyers, doctors, people like that. My father grew up on a little dirt farm up in outside of Leesburg, Virginia and uh, his father had a little store on the corner. They had a six-acre farm and on the corner, uh, it's called North Fork, he was the um, blacksmith he was the uh, postmaster, and he was the, the mechanic. He usually got paid in terms of corn and feed and that kind of thing, but uh, that's the environment my father grew up in. My father left home when he was 16, came to D.C., and uh, joined the Marine Corps, and he served in China for three years, was a China Marine, and then served in the Philippines, came back to D.C., and was... Uh, uh, educated at the National Radio Institute in sound wave technology and did that at uh, uh, Naval Research Laboratories uh, actually for 20 some years. At lunchtime he would go by the glass shop and see them making glass apparatus that was used by the chemist to do experiments back before computers. He learned that skill and then became a professor at the University of Maryland. He had a business on the side and so I was one of five children I grew up hearing my father tell me how he was uh, basically able to go out and work two jobs at the same time he was going to school to be able to help support himself during his first 16 years. Once he got out of the Marine Corps and came back, heard stories about his getting a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, and I guess, you know, my father, like Brian was saying, he looked to me, I looked to my father, and my father said, you know, you're my only son, I have five, five children, four daughters, I really am hoping that, uh, you know, you'll set some goals and you'll achieve those goals. And when I wanted something or needed something, whether it was a motorbike in the beginning or a motorcycle, he would always start me out. He would help me get that first $10 wizard motorbike, but encouraged me then to fix it up and buy another one and another one. So over the years, I was able to actually uh, elevate myself in terms of motorcycles, cars, things like that, by working hard to get those things. But when I was very, very young, I served the newspapers, I sold produce in the neighborhood. We actually had chickens in our backyard, just enough. We had a community garden where my mother 
uh, canned or own vegetables. So even though I grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, I grew up in a situation similar to my father. But when I was in school, I was working uh, selling men's clothes in a department store. I was working at a gas station and uh, trying to make uh, money I needed to get through college. And a friend of mine actually came in with a business, uh, no, a little card one day, and he said, here's an ad in Student Union at University of Maryland looking for somebody to be a night watchman for a builder. And uh, everybody laughed about it. I stuck the card in my pocket, called the builder, got a job with him for $1.10 an hour, which allowed me when I got out of school in the afternoon to go and work, study, close up the houses, and learn a little bit about the building end of it. While I was there, it was a woman that was uh, selling those houses with an eighth grade education, making $28,000 a year at a time. My buddies were graduating from Maryland and making $5,500 a year. My father was making $9,500 a year. So I said, you know, $9,500, $28,500, got my real estate license. That got me into real estate between my sophomore and junior year of college. And I went in and interviewed with a man, his name was Julian Colquitt, who said, don't come into this business was you want to work hard enough to be a millionaire in five years and retire in 10 years. I said, hmm, average sales price was about $25,000. How do you do that? And he said, you know, I'll show you how to do it. He wasn't a member of multiple listing, but he was a master at marketing. And uh, he had a pitch book before anybody else did. He just gave us really, really great skills. Uh, did well the first summer. I bought a new Corvette, paid my, my college expenses, fraternity bills. The next summer did well enough. I married Brian's mother. Uh, and uh, went on, finished my senior year of college. I thought I was going to go in the Air Force as a pilot. Turned out when I went for my last flight physical in Andrews Air Force Base at a lazy eye muscle, which washed me out, which gave me the opportunity to come back on a full-time basis to real estate. And uh, Trey and Kaufman also said, you know, what you really want is you want to create some positive cash flow. If you truly want to be independent, the way to be independent is have enough positive cash flow that you don't have to worry about going to work every day. You can do exactly what you wanted to do. And so every year after I got out of college, I bought two houses. At the end of 10 years, I had 20 houses. There's 20 houses I paid off within, within 15 years. So one, I was a millionaire. Two, I had almost $300,000 in positive cash flow coming in at a time where that was a lot of money. And uh, opened my, actually bought my partner out built the biggest real estate company in the Washington area, ended up selling that to Merrill Lynch, retiring when I was 38, had bought some commercial buildings along the way. In fact, the first building I bought in Bethesda, a little old house on East West Highway, turned out they built a McDonald's around me. I paid $200,000 for that and ended up not only selling the building, but selling an option I had for going back in the building for a total of $6.4 over the last two years. So if I didn't do anything but that one office, um, that would have pretty well set me for life. But Along the way, you know, there were opportunities. Agents that worked for me would bring me deals and I would pick up commercial buildings and industrial park, things like that. So I find myself now, um, I guess, enjoying the fact that I could do what I wanted to do ever since I was probably 28 years old and still, you know, wanting to get up every day and still aggressively building houses in Bethesda and building houses for myself. Uh, uh, Brian has a number of lots as as I do down at the Turks and Caicos Islands. We have a house down there. We're going to get, we're going to be building some uh, rental houses down there soon. My other son, Tommy, has part of a marina down there. So I think whether it be developing in the islands, whether it be developing in Bethesda right now, building a new house for ourselves there, um, I really think that's what keeps me young. I'll be 74 on June 10th of this year. Uh, and I feel that that's really what's kept me going. But I think, you know, really, again, be able to establish that whatever you do, that positive cash flow, that independence um, is, is critical. Well, you know, I've, I've obviously, you know, know my dad's story um, all these years. Uh, it inspires me to, to know that, you know, anybody can do what he's talking about. You know, he's along the way, he's gotten very good at, at, at a lot of things. You know, when it comes to real estate, as an example, I've got a house on the market right now that I haven't been able to sell up in Maryland, my old house been on the market for about a year. And every time I talk to him, he's like, have you sold that house yet? I'm like, no, I haven't sold the house yet. There's, it hasn't sold. Why don't you do this? Why don't you, you know, you're asking 900 for it. Why don't you go find somebody who's got a house that's $400,000 and do a swap out with them, do a trade, take their house and, and take a note. And I'm like, you know what? You're, you're, you're like way beyond me. You're, you're like completely talking out of my pay grade. But one of the things that I, I, um, I think that every one of us can get from this conversation 
is the fact that um, his drive, you know, here's somebody who, and he didn't tell you all of his, um, his um, health story, but had his first heart attack at 32 and a quadruple bypass at 38, a double at 46. And, and my whole life, um, you know, growing up as a young child, you know, I was always hearing doctors saying that your dad's, you know, not doing well. And, um, you know, and since then has had all kinds of other things that have come up and, and he's beat and so forth. And, um, you know, I think the doctors, you know, are, are amazed at, at, at uh, in his mid seventies, he's, he's still rocking and rolling, not only alive and enjoying life. Um, you know, he's legally blind. So I don't even know if he can even see the, can you even see the words they're putting on there? Yeah. Um, can you see these hearts that are going up here? No. Okay. Well, there's a bunch of hearts that are going up right now. So anytime somebody likes what you're saying, they tap the screen and it sends hearts up. It's basically saying, hey, we love what you're saying. And they've been saying a lot of nice comments along the way. But, you know, look, think, think about this. At the, at the end of the day, he's still rolling. He, what, what, what keeps him alive, and not just like alive, like physically alive, but keeps him feeling alive is following his passion. His passion has been real estate and business and, and creating success and, and, and providing for our family. It's just been, you know, amazing to watch him. And that, and, and again, we are a product of, of our environment. So if you grew up with a dad like him, you probably would be a little bit more like me. Um, we all, you know, we, you know, our parents, our household, our friends, our associations, the school we went to, the neighborhood that we, we that we grew up in, and and the books we read, the people we meet, they, they, they all have uh, a profound impact on us. And so, you know, uh, a couple of things I want to ask, and then I'll let, I know he's anxious to get out on the beach to hang out with the family. Um, what would you say to people that are, you know, entrepreneurs? Everybody on here is an entrepreneur. Um, they're all looking to make their way, carve their path. Um, I think most people that are on here that are following me on Periscope are, are network marketers. Uh, I know years ago, um, back in the, uh, in the 90s, when I first got into network marketing, you weren't uh, uh, real keen on the idea. Uh, and I know your, your idea was for uh, my brother and I to be focused on, on building the real estate company together with you. And I know that um, along the way, you probably have grew, grew to appreciate more and more what it is I do. But maybe you can share with everybody some perspective on how you used to look at the industry that I'm in, um, how you see it now, and maybe some advice for the people that are up and comers that are just starting to, to build their, their uh, empire in network marketing. Well, I think as I said uh, early, earlier in this conversation, I met my wife, well, I didn't say this, but I met my wife when she was 15 years old. She was a, a majorette at a local high school and I was a page of the US Capitol earning money while I was going to high school. And uh, in meeting my wife, uh, I had a challenge um, because she had told her mother that I rode a motorcycle and raced cars and hung around the hot shops and all of that. They used to call the guys around the hot shop futures because we had no futures. So for the first couple of years, my wife would be picked up by one of my buddies and dropped off because her mother wouldn't let her see me. So that was a challenge for both of us. But her father worked uh, at NIH um, and uh, didn't make a great deal of money. Um, my father, as I mentioned before, was a glass boy, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. And uh, so if I wanted those things that I you know, aspired to have, the new cars, the motorcycles, what Brian didn't mention is I have not been able to drive in 17 years, but I still have a Ferrari, I still have a Harley Davidson, I still have all those toys, and I'm still working with the Wilmer Clinic at Hopkins. I'm just dead set on the fact that through stem cell research, they'll be able to reverse the eye condition I have and I'll be riding my own motorcycle. But it is frustrating to have to ride around in the, the Ferrari with the top down with my wife driving. <laughs> my wife's only five feet tall, she has to sit on a cushion. And I was gonna trade that in on uh, Brian, or Brian's you know, pet cars, which is the Bentley GTC. And we're driving through Naples in my red Ferrari and we stopped at a uh, stop sign and people walking across were waving to my wife and taking pictures and all. We got to the intersection, turned to me, he said, I'm not trading this in a Bentley. Everybody down here's got one of these. I still want that red Ferrari. <laughs> so, so we still have that. We still have our toys. And, you know, I, I, you know, my doctor asked me one day years ago, because he gave me four years to live in 1974, what my secret was. And my secret was that I married um, the most beautiful girl in my high school class. Uh, actually, not in my class, but in, in high school. I actually left Page School to come back to go to high school with her. We've been married for over 50 years now. 
And uh, since I did very well financially early in life, I wasn't about to die and leave her that money to go out and marry somebody else. So out of spite, <laughs> I'm staying alive at this point, uh, which my doctor often throws up to anybody coming in and says, you know, I'm not well, I'm just going to stay home, I'm not going to do anything. And they could, you know, why don't you be like Tom Carruthers? He still works 20 hours a day. And I honestly think that is my secret. I had a grandfather who, quite frankly, worked for Southern Railways. They, were, they gave him a retirement party at 65, at 70, at 75, and at 80, they made him go home. Two months later, after sitting down and smoking a pipe, reading a newspaper, he was in a nursing home, and three months later died. So I honestly think if anybody ever really slows me down, I'll probably be in a nursing home. But right now, I keep going on momentum. I love life. I love cars, motorcycles, a beautiful wife. You know, I, when I get up in the morning, I'm just thankful, particularly thankful, too, for having four wonderful children. Brian is so successful. We're so proud of him. I mean, I tell you, I was out of Naples one day, and I'm walking down the street, and I stopped to look at a classic car that I had back when I was younger. And the man, man that owned the gas station came out, and he said, he used in the car. And I said, yeah. So he gets on the phone and calls the owner. And he hears me, overhears me talking to the owner about my name being Tom Carruthers, being from Potomac, Maryland. He, his wife kind of came around behind me, and they're putting up a camera, taking a picture of us, the three of us together on the phone. And I said, what's all this about? He said, I know you must be Brian's dad. And I said, how did you know that? He said, well, he, he inspires me. I'm on the phone with him every night. So here I am walking into a gas station in Naples, Florida, and a guy comes out and knows Brian. And you know what's really embarrassing, though? I went, we're Redskins fans. And I'm going to a Redskins game one day, and I pull in to the Living Park at a hotel parking lot. Cop comes up, and he said, what are you doing? I told him to the Redskins game. He said, what kind of car is that? I said, it's a big Range Rover. He said, what do you do for a living? I said, real estate. He said, what's your name? I said, Carruthers. Are you Brian Carruthers' son? I said, yeah. He said, go ahead and park there. Son or dad? It's, I'm sorry. Or dad. I, I'm Brian yeah. Carruthers' dad. That's <laughs> my son. So, you know, it's funny. I came back in the car and I said to my wife, I said, you know, it's no longer Tom Carruthers or Culpert Carruthers or Prudential Carruthers. It's Brian Carruthers' son. I never, no matter where I go, I'm always, you know, the perspective is, oh, your son's Brian? It's really, really, I'm very proud of Brad, and I'm very proud of his success, and I'm very proud of, again, when he said I wanted to become a real estate, it's interesting. I was a typical Jewish mother. I was sitting out on a beach here in Ocean City years ago when he was in college. He and his brother were surfing, and they came in, and I said, you know, one a doctor, one a lawyer. I said, no, Dad, you've been successful in real estate. That's what we want to do. So I said, well, I guess I've got to build a big real estate company again. So we started building the second company, and when Brian came in to me and told me he was leaving the family business, to go into network marketing. Um, I first called my psychiatrist, then I tried to lock him in his room, neither one <laughs> worked out. But now he makes more money than I do. So, you know, looking back on it, it was obviously a great decision. Well, yeah, at the beginning, he wasn't, he certainly wasn't excited about me doing something else. And I get that, you know, the, the dream was for, you know, us all to, to build a huge real estate empire together. Um, they went on to do that. You know, he's, he's, he's very modest, obviously, as well. You probably can tell, um, you know, when he, when he sold his first real estate company to Merrill Lynch in, in uh, 1981, he was 38 years old. Uh, can you imagine selling your, your, your business for eight figures uh, when you're 38 years old and retiring and at age 43 feeling bored and like, I don't want to be retired. I want to work. I want to build. I want to go out there and chase something. And he started a real estate company all over again. And uh, for, for, for my brother and I to be able to, to jump into that business with them and, and uh, you know, grew, grew the company all over again. And, and um, one of the things that I, uh, I always just kind of laugh about is um, I was sitting in my Rockville, Maryland real estate office that I just opened up for, for the company. And my, I, I fell in love with network marketing. I love the idea of leverage, of recruiting and building teams and mentoring everybody that's, that, that joins your team. And so I went to my brother and my dad. I said, look, I want to, I want to, you know, introduce network marketing into the real estate profession. And instead of just a broker getting overrides when all the realtors sell houses, what if other realtors could recruit their friends from other companies, bring them on board, and their real estate agent can earn a, a piece of the action on their friend sales? And um, 
it, it's, it was funny because, you know, they basically were not really keen on it. They said, hey, look, you go do that in your office over there. We're going to keep, you know, going with the, the, the uh, traditional business model we've always operated in, which, by the way, is totally a smart thing to do is stick with your proven model. Um, but I was trying to hire another real estate agent that came into my, my office one day, absolutely Keller Williams, we're saying Keller Williams on, on there, you know, Keller Williams, Exit First. Now, you know, a lot of companies out there are, are, have introduced the opportunity for agents to recruit other agents and get paid. But um, I, was I was sitting in my office one day trying to hire this other realtor and he winds up telling me, I want you to look at my network marketing business first before I start talking about transferring my license over. And the craziest thing in the world is that guy wound up recruiting me into the company that I'm in today, which was 17 and a half years ago. So I'm trying to hire him. He winds up getting me excited about his company. And I, very shortly after that, started making so much money, I, I told my, my, my dad, my, my brother, I was going to leave the family real estate business altogether and just go full-time in network marketing. And, and again, that was met with resistance. Trust me. Uh, I mean, and I'll just be honest, you know. Uh, over the years, uh, early on, I, I cried buckets of tears um, at night. Um, you know, when things were going as well as I wanted it to, and, and I wouldn't get the kind of support that uh, I thought I would get from friends and and from from family. And and, and you you guys are all going to go through that. You're going to have your spouse might not totally get your vision. Your 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 parents, your siblings, your neighbors, your best friends they might not they might not see it. But when you read Forbes magazine. Um, or you watch uh, these shows on TV with these ma massively successful people, m I I've, I've seldom read a story where that person is saying, oh yeah, look, I'm a billionaire, I'm worth hundreds of millions, and it was so awesome because as soon as I came up with this idea, every one of my friends and family said, oh yeah, go, do it, you're going to succeed, that's the best idea I've ever heard. I've never read that story. Let me ask you guys a question. Have you all, just write, type yes or no, have you ever read that story where the person became a wild success and everybody said, oh, that's an absolute home run, just go for it. I mean, it's it, yes or no. You guys can give me a little interaction here. So what I would encourage you all to do is, is just, my, the, the, the founder of, of a company I'm in right now, he's no longer alive, he passed away a little over a year ago. He always said the greatest sale you can ever make is when you sell yourself. You've got to sell yourself on what you're doing. When you get so sold out, you buy it hook, line, and sinker, and you say, you know what, I don't care what my family says, I don't care what my friends say, I'm going to go out there, mass the best revenge is massive success, it's not like getting revenge, but it's the best way to silence the critics is to go out there and be, your, have your success be so loud and so obvious. That's what I just encourage you guys to do. Um, you know, watching my dad, you know, you know, the real estate game is, is not easy. I mean, everybody out there is in the real estate business. Either, either they, they got a license or somebody in their family's got a license and it's, it's very, very cutthroat and, and very um, you know, competition ridden. And yet he still went out and built a second real estate company after I, had gone, I left when we had 20 some offices, 24 offices and sold out to one of the biggest credit unions in the country a couple of years ago when they had 30 some offices. I mean, huge, huge success. And so um, I would just encourage you all to um, just think about some of the things you're hearing right now. Um, and again, you know, my dad has always been so humble. Uh, if you ever sat down with him, to, you know, he doesn't, by the way, he doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. So you can't go out and have a beer with him. You can't go out and have a, have a, have a smoke with him. Um, you know, and I was listening to Donald Trump, whether you like Donald Trump or not. I was listening to him on a little interview when I was getting ready to walk out the door to go fishing last night. He was being interviewed by Megyn Kelly, and he talked about how his brother was an alcoholic. And it caused him to go the opposite route, and and for him to never never take a sip of, sip of alcohol. Um, I, I you know, and and by the way, uh, I had a couple of drinks last night and a couple of drinks the night before since I've been down here at the beach. Uh, I'm not against drinking, but I was actually talking to uh, somebody a couple of days ago about drinking and how interesting it is that people get to a place in life where they look forward to consuming something that's going to dull their brain. Like life is, is, is like so bad or, you know, having clarity is just so painful that they have to actually dull themselves. They have to bring, the, they have to like numb their brain. It, it doesn't make sense. You know, I, I partake in drinking sometimes. So trust me, I'm not uh, against drinking, but think about that. Some of the most successful people in the world, you know, whether it be Donald Trump or, or my, my own father and I, there's other stories out there, um, they don't feel like they need to dull their life, to dull their brain because life is so bad. You know, they want to have clarity. They want to wake up with 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 a with a, a pep in their step the next morning, and not ha having a hangover, if that makes sense. So, you know, just um, I don't know if you have any last uh, you know 
closing thoughts. I know you want to get out on the beach, but. Well, Brian, I think that, you know, to pick up on a couple of things you said, one is to say that I probably would have been a hundred times more successful had I listened to Brian back when he was talking about not leaving to go into the business he's in, but rather changing the character of the business in a way that Keller Williams later did. We could have been the Keller Williams. Gary Keller went through the same process down in Austin, Texas that Brian was going through uh, at the time he did, but Keller did it later. So we could have been that innovator in the DC area and gone national with that. So if, if I blame myself, but mainly my son Brian and our, our general manager at the time, ah, oh, we don't need to do that. You know, that's, that's not something we need to do. And come to find out, it, it really has been wonderful. In fact, somebody asked me the other day, if I were to start another real estate company and I were looking for a franchise, what would the franchise be that I'd be most likely to sign on for? And it would be Keller Williams because of the very aspect that Brian has talked about in terms of being able to motivate people by helping you recruit because recruiting is a big part of it. I mean, what caused me to be so successful in my early 20s in real estate was I reached out to everybody, whether it was my fraternity brothers from college, high school buddies, guys I rode motorcycles with, um, race cars at a Quasco drag strip, whatever. I reached out to everybody and said, I have found the secret. The secrets come in and don't look for a salary position, become an independent contractor. Don't wait for somebody to pat you on the back and say, you know, you've been successful. We're going to give you a new title. We're going to give you a raise. Give yourself a raise. Anytime you want to, just go out and list another house, sell another house. And based on that, take a certain part of that income that you're making and invest it. You know, some people want to invest in the stock market. You know, quite frankly, I did that late in life. Didn't do as well as I did with real estate. I probably should have stuck with real estate. But I've done extremely well in real estate. And, you know, Donald Trump doesn't drink because of his brother. I don't drink not because I have anything against drinking. My father had a drinking problem. He wasn't an alcoholic, but coming out of the Marine Corps and uh, having five children, he was under a lot of stress. He drank a lot of beer. And one day we were in the car when I was 10 years old. And he was taking me out to Skagsville, Maryland to pick up bushels of corn to sell in the neighborhood. And he had stopped at a liquor store and got three cases of the cheapest beer you could buy. And I said to Dad, I said, Dad, you know, you're going to have a heart condition. Mom said, why do you drink? And he stopped the car on the side of the road and he said, son, you're only 10. So I know you don't totally understand what I'm talking about. But if I thought as my only, you being my only son that you weren't going to drink, I'd stop right now. As important as it is to me. I said, okay. He threw the, the beer, case of the beer in the honeysuckle. When he died at 89 years old, he had not had another drink. When I was in Maryland, for those of you from Maryland, you may know a bar called Town Hall. I'd go up with all the guys. I'd sit and have my Coke and, you know, have a good time with him. I wasn't drinking. And one night back in those days, it was $135 for your spring semester to your tuition. And they offered me $135 to take a beer. And I said, no. I made a commitment to my father. So commitment is very, very important, whether it be to the job that you have, to your children. You know, Brian is one of the best dads I know. And I think, you know, if you're if, if you're really loving with your dad, you're loving with, I, you know, I've seen the people that he's worked with. I've gone to conventions out in, in Vegas where Brian has spoken. I tell you, I've seen Brian in a situation where he couldn't shake hands anymore because his hand hurt. And I really had more pats on my back. I came back bruised. Everybody said, oh, you're Brian's dad patting me on the back. So it's that kind of excitement and that kind of enthusiasm that I feel when I go to conferences that I've been privileged to go. When Brian got his first million dollar ring, you know, back then, my wife used the camera with, with film and left it in the uh, taxi cab. She went crazy all night trying to find that taxi cab just to get the film back of the picture. She stood up on a chair in front of somebody taking pictures. Of, it's that kind of pride, that kind of ownership in what you do. And, you know, I think Brian has told me, and I feel the same way, when I sold real estate or invest in deals, started banks, rode motorcycles across the country, raced motorcycles, and I could, it was always a matter of that's what I wanted to do. That was my passion. And if your passion can be coupled with making a lot of money, and that money, again, gives you the independence, I mean, you know, quite frankly, we're blessed because we have a number of homes. We have, um, you know, a bucket list I'm still trying to finish. But, you know, we have the capacity to do that. And I would encourage any of you that are working with Brian to, to look at Brian as a model, not only in terms of his success and the money he's made, but also in terms of his family and his son. His son should be on here being interviewed. At nine years old, he could tell you what he thinks of his dad. And it's what we all think of him. 
Well, well the cool thing is that um, this periscope is a live thing. It goes away after 24 hours, so anybody that missed it, they're going to be able to get on there and see it. But I'm going to save this uh, to my hard drive and uh, keep this interview forever. So uh, I think I think what we all need to do, and, and hearing my dad say these nice things, I don't know if you say these things off camera. This is how I guess putting the camera in his face, getting drawing some of this cool stuff out. But yeah, especially you all heard that he said I was his number one child. That's, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I just I I, I really do uh, appreciate this opportunity to um, get on camera with him, uh, with all of you guys involved. Um, you know, I I do hope that anything I can do to inspire you. Uh, I've had inspirational people like my dad. Uh, in my life, um, you know, he was a great dad for me, and therefore, of course, I'm going to be a great dad for for my son. You know, he provided well for us and gave us a beach house to to grow up in and put us through private schools. And we went to college, didn't have to have a job in college. Um, you know, I did have an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit all along. So I was during college, I was coming home every couple after a couple of weeks to do baseball card shows, selling you know uh, sports collectibles. You know, at at at, at, uh, at the card shows on weekends, making. Sometimes in a, in a weekend, what some people would make in a month at their job, it was, it was really cool. But again, I learned all that uh, just by being around this kind of uh, spirit. So I hope that you guys got some, um, some great takeaways. Before we wrap up here, I see you guys are posting a few comments. Um, if you guys would just share uh, in the comment section your number one takeaway, you know, what it is that you felt that you gained from the last half an hour we've been spending together here. I think this is a time investment um, I asked my dad to, to jump on here so I can ask him to share his story and, and share some insights with you all. What is it that you got from him um, that, uh, you, that you'll take away and you'll uh, plant that seed inside of you? And look, you can, never, you can always count the number of seeds in, apple, in an apple, but you can never count the number of apples in a seed. So the seed that was planted in you today, um, if you allow it to take root, and you cultivate it. And cultivation requires sun and it requires rain. You can't have all nothing but sunny days because you don't have a burnout crop, you'll never get any fruit. So, um, but what seed are you planting inside of you from this Periscope today that you're gonna take with you for the rest of your life? Stay focused, never stop working, work hard. Um, uh, focus towards your goals, commitment, don't quit. I'm just reading off some of these, you guys. Um, commitment, clarity, ownership, commitment and perseverance, commitment, integrity, commitment, hard work, commitment and hard work, work ethic, live with purpose, importance of fathers, seeing great examples, for, setting great examples for their children, be passionate, never give up, uh, go after what you want. That's awesome, you guys. Don't be afraid of failure. We all fail. If you're su successful more than 51% of the time, you're going to be successful in life. But if you don't take risk, if you don't, if you're afraid of rejection, if you're afraid every time you call somebody, they're gonna say, "Well, I don't want your product, or I don't want your service, or I don't even want to talk to you," and hang up. My God, when I first got in real estate, when I think how many people didn't want to talk to me about listing their house or coming into the business, you just have to look beyond that. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, it's not too late if you want to swipe up or to the side and share or invite your followers to be able to watch this because if you don't invite them, they won't get an alert to come check out the replay and they will have missed out on an opportunity of a lifetime in my opinion. Uh, I, I don't think I'm going to be po posting this interview anywhere else. I promised you guys as a special treat for getting a million hearts in the month of May. Uh, we probably got you know, half a million on this one, one video cast alone. The hearts have been going nonstop so I appreciate that. But I'll give you guys another, another 30 seconds to go ahead and swipe and share. Um, and swipe and invite your followers. Uh, invite them all to come see this. Even if they jump on right now, they'll be able to catch the replay uh, later on this afternoon if they want to. Uh, I, 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 look, you know, you heard about my, uh, you know, my father's father, you know, with the Marine Corps. Uh, he did not die in the Marine Corps. Um, you know, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend here in the United States. I know we've got people that are watching this scope all over the world. Uh, but here in America, uh, people who serve our country, they deserve uh, a major uh, uh, debt of gratitude that we all owe because freedom is not free. It's never been, never will be. Uh, but this weekend is not just for the service, uh, service men and women, but it's also for those, it's, it's supposed to be for those who um, gave up their lives for our freedom. Uh, we memorialize everybody who has done that uh, in the history of our country. So uh, let's, let's uh, go forward in this weekend. Um, you know, be focused on what you want to accomplish. 
Um, you know, you know, yes, you'll have some time to spend with family and friends and, and have a beer if you want to have a beer. Again, nothing wrong with that. Of course, I'm going to have one later on today, I'm sure. But um, I do want you guys to, to always just know that um, freedom is not free, you know, whether it be freedom for our country or whether it be freedom for our family. You have to give up to go up. You have to make sacrifices so that we can have a better day tomorrow. So have a great day, you guys. I appreciate this opportunity. And thank you, Dad. I love you so much. Appreciate you. Proud of you. And we'll see you guys soon.